drivers of consumer spending worldwide. Digging a little deeper into the data, we can see positive benefits that flow from both the quality of spending and the quantity of saving by women. Because multiple studies have shown that women spend more of their earned income on food, health care, home improvement, and schooling for themselves and their children. In short, they reinvest. And that kind of spending has a multiplier effect, leading to more job growth and diversified local economies. <coughs> And that, in turn, can help ensure better educated, healthier citizens, as well as provide a cushion in the event of market downturns. The research also shows that women are stronger savers than men. Data, does that surprise any of the women? <laughs> Data from 20 semi-industrialized countries suggest that for every one percentage point increase in the share of household income generated by women, aggregate domestic savings increase by roughly 15 basis points. And a higher savings rate translates into a higher tax base as well. Integrating women more effectively into the way businesses invest, market, and recruit also yields benefits in terms of profitability and corporate governance. In a McKinsey survey, a third of executives reported increased profits as a result of investments in empowering women in emerging markets. Research also demonstrates a strong correlation between higher degrees of gender diversity in the leadership ranks of business and organizational performance. The World Bank finds that by eliminating discrimination against female workers and managers, managers could significantly increase productivity per worker by 25 to 40%. Reducing barriers, preventing women from working in certain sectors would lower the productivity gap between male and female workers by a third to one half across a range of countries. Now these gains are achieved because removing barriers means that the talent and skills of women can be deployed more efficiently. And in our globalized world today, this is a competitive edge that is more important than ever. All of this underscores my primary point. When we liberate the economic potential of women, we elevate the economic performance of communities, nations, and the world. Take just one sector of our economy, agriculture, to illustrate what I mean. We know women play an important role in driving agriculture-led growth worldwide. Agriculture is a powerful engine for development, as we have seen in the remarkable rise of China and India. And in several APAC economies, women comprise nearly half of the agriculture labor force. They sustain every link in the agricultural chain. They plant the seeds, they care for the livestock, they harvest the crops, they sell them at markets, they store the food, and then they prepare it for consumption. But as for the role of women in agriculture nowadays, despite their presence in all of these kinds of jobs, they have less to show for all of their work. Women farmers are up to 30% less productive than male farmers. And that's not because they are working less or less committed. It's because women farmers have access to fewer resources. They have less fertilizer, fewer tools, poorer quality seeds, and less access to training or to land. And they have much less time to farm because they also have to do most of the household work. When that resource gap is closed and resources are allocated equally, and better yet, efficiently, women and men are equally productive in agriculture. And that has positive benefits. In Nepal, for example, where mothers have greater ownership of land because of their inheritance rights, there are fewer severely underweight children. So what we have here is an opportunity to accelerate growth in developing economies while at the same time producing more and cheaper food for our planet. Close the resource gap, holding women back in developing economies, and we could feed 150 million more people worldwide every year. And that's according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. 
And that's in addition to the higher incomes for families and the more efficient markets and the more agricultural trade that would result. The same kind of impact can be seen in other sectors in our economies because we know that the entrepreneurial spirit of women is strong. More than half a million enterprises in Indonesia and nearly 400,000 in Korea are headed by women. They run fully 20% of all of China's small businesses. All across Asia, women have and continue to dominate light manufacturing sectors that have proved crucial to the region's economic takeoff. And economists predict that women-owned businesses, which now provide for 16% of all U.S. jobs, will create nearly a third of the new jobs anticipated over the next seven years. So with that kind of evidence at hand, it is little wonder that the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Report finds a direct correlation between the gender gap and economic productivity. The lower the former, the higher the latter. As Klaus Schwab, the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, concludes, women and girls must be treated equally if a country is to grow and prosper. The declaration we will adopt here today can begin to close that gender gap by making it possible for more women to unleash their potential as workers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. And the goals in this declaration are very specific. We commit to giving women access to capital so women entrepreneurs can turn their ideas into the small and medium enterprises that are the source of so much growth and job creation. We urge examining and reforming our legal and regulatory systems so women can avail themselves of the full range of financial services. And such reforms can also help ensure that women are not forced to compromise on the well-being of their children to pursue a business career. We must improve women's access to markets so those who start businesses can keep them open. For example, we need to correct the problem of what's called information asymmetric uh, problem, meaning that women are not informed about the trade and technical assistance programs that are available, as we just discussed in agriculture. There are two State Department programs that we are using to try to model a lot of these approaches. A program called Pathways to Prosperity uh, connects policymakers and private sector leaders in 15 countries across the Americas. It's aimed at helping small business owners, small farmers, craftspeople do more business, both lo locally and through regional trade. And the African Women's Entrepreneurship Program reaches out to women that are part of the African Growth and Opportunity Act countries to provide them with information and tools to take advantage of what AGOA has to offer. And then finally, we must support the rise of women leaders in the public and private sectors because they bring first-hand knowledge and understanding of these challenges, and their perspectives will add great value as we shape policies and programs that will eliminate barriers to bring women into all economic sectors. Several businesses are already taking significant steps to meet such goals. Goldman Sachs is training the next generation of women business leaders in developing economies with its 10,000 women campaign. Coca-Cola's 5 by 20 campaign aims to support 5 million women entrepreneurs worldwide by 2020. And just this week, Walmart announced that it will use its purchasing power to support women entrepreneurs by doubling the amount of goods it will buy from women-owned businesses globally to $20 billion by 2016. In addition, Walmart will invest $100 million to help women develop their job skills, including women who work on the farms and factories overseas that are Walmart suppliers. Now, these programs are just the start of the type of permanent shift we need to see in how businesses worldwide invest in women. Now, I do not underestimate the difficulty of ushering in what I call the participation age. Legal changes require political will. Cultural and behavioral changes require social will. 
All of this requires leadership by government, civil society, and the private sector. And even when countries pursue aggressive structural reforms to get more women into their economy and enhance their productivity, they don't always produce the results that we would like to see. So we have to stay with this. Persistence is part of our long-term plan. And while economic orders may be hard to change, and policy strategies, no matter how good, can only get us so far, we all have to make a choice, not simply to remove barriers, but to really fill this field with active investment and involvement from all of us. Those of you who are here today are leaders from across the APEC region. And it is your choice to come here, it is your choice to focus on uh, women and the economy that will send a message rippling across uh, APEC. And the countless decisions that will be taken by leaders and citizens to encourage young girls to stay in school, to acquire skills, to talk to that banker, to understand what it means to give a loan to a woman who will work her heart out to produce a result for herself uh, and her children. And when we do that, we are going to really make a big difference in helping elevate the age of participation for women. And there are many other areas we have to be attentive to. Our medical research dollars we need to be sure that we are equally investing in women as men. Our tax systems have to ensure that we don't either deliberately or inadvertently uh, discriminate against women, uh, and women should be given the same opportunities to you know, be productive and contributing members of society. But big and bold ideas, I think, are called for in our world today. Uh, because a lot of what we're doing is not achieving the outcomes that we are seeking. There is a stimulative and ripple effect that kicks in when women have greater access to jobs and the economic fortunes of their families, their communities, and their countries. Now many people say that there are all kinds of benefits that will flow from this, but I want to be somewhat modest in our goals. Uh, yes, I do think it will produce more food and more educational opportunity and more financial stability for more families around the world, and that will have dividends across the full spectrum of society. But our declaration will be meaningless if we don't put our will and effort behind it. I think this summit just might make the history books if people look back in years to come and say that meeting in San Francisco with all of those important people from across the Asia Pacific region said something that had never been said before. They didn't just assert that involving women was the good thing to do or the right thing to do. They put their heads together and came up with a declaration committing themselves to, to really tackle the obstacles because it will benefit the people we all represent. And then we need to measure our progress to be sure that we are tracking what we care about. We obviously do that in our own lives, but it's important we do it across our countries and our regions. And I'm sure that if we leave this sum and we go back to our governments, and our businesses and focus on how we're going to improve employment, bring down national debt, create greater trade between us, tackling all of that, and always in the back of our mind, keep in focus what more can we do to make sure women contribute to those results. We will see progress. And we will be in the lead at not only asserting what we think should be done, but in measuring and tracking how well we are doing. So I thank you for gathering here in San Francisco, mindful that we're on a long journey together. I look out and I see friends from across the region representing countries that have been so amazing in the progress that you have made in the last 50 years, even in the last 30 years. It will take time, it will take our concerted effort but I am convinced that if we come into pursuing the promise of this participation age and unleashing and harnessing the economic potential of women, we will see a new and better future. 
That is why I am honored to be here, representing the people of the United States, bearing witness to what begins right